We welcome you very warmly to our evening service. It's good to be together for the worship of God. And uh, this evening we are beginning a new study, a new series in the life of Gideon. And uh, we look forward uh, to uh, the sermon later on when John will lead us in that first uh, study. We come together to praise our God, to worship him, and to give thanks for his many blessings in Christ. And so we sing together in all oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Well, let's come now before our God 
in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. We pray that you would help us to praise you were right. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing our great Redeemer's praise. We are very aware and very conscious tonight, O oh God, if it were not for the gift of your Son and for the sacrifice he offered in our place at Calvary, we could never come to you and we would never know the forgiveness of sins. We are very aware, O oh God, that there is no other way of salvation apart from faith in Jesus Christ. And so we praise you tonight with all our hearts for the gift of the Jesus and for all that he has done on our behalf in our place. O oh Lord our God, we are not as grateful as we should be. We don't appreciate as we ought the depth of our sin and the awfulness of sin, the huge chasm that existed between us and you. And here is your son, our savior, coming from glory that we might be saved. We bless you, O oh God, from the depths of our being. And Father, as we come to you, we're conscious that sin is no longer the reigning dominant influence in our lives. We bless you that we have a new master in Christ. We thank you that by his grace, we are no longer on the broad road, no longer in the world, but yet we are aware that there is sin within. And we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to put that sin to death, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to mortify the body. We ask for this, O oh God, and we pray that you would give us help in this warfare against indwelling sin. We feel the intensity of it often. And we pray that you would help us to look to you for power, the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us, enabling us to die unto sin and to live for Christ. Pray that this service may be a help to us along the way. We ask our Father that it may be a means of grace to our souls that we may leave strengthened in our faith and better equipped to serve you and more prepared to live to your glory. Oh God, our Father, come to us now by your Holy Spirit, we pray, and enable us, O oh God, to be still in your presence. Shut out the distractions that just flood into our minds at this time. All sorts of things, some trivial, some important. We think of those things that are weighing us down and are causing us to be troubled in our spirit. And we ask for a time, O oh Lord, that we may just be able to feed upon the word and to soak it in and to apply it to our hearts. Praise you, O oh God, for one another. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Stramalis. We thank you that you've called us into your family. And we thank you for this family gathering tonight. And we pray that you would help us to appreciate and to love one another in the Lord. O oh God, our Father, we ask that you would hear us too as we confess our sin. We've, we've turned aside from you, O oh God. We, we haven't loved you with all our heart and soul and being, and you know all about us. You know the sin that is within. You know, oh God, the ways in which we've let you down, even in this week that has passed. Known not to anybody else, but known unto you, oh God, and so we confess it to you now. And we pray that you would look upon us in mercy, that you would deal with us in grace, and that you might hear our cry for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's turn to the book of Psalms and to the Psalm 85. In times past, Lord, you showed favor to your own beloved land, the prosperity of Jacob you restored by your strong hand. Uh, as we work our way through this psalm, the psalmist is praying that God will come in revival, uh, that God will pour out his spirit and that things will happen throughout the land. And that's our prayer tonight, isn't it? This uh, land in which we live is full of faithful ministries all over the country. There are men who are faithfully preaching the gospel and faithfully preaching the word of God. But we want to see more happening. And for that to take place, we need an outpouring of God's spirit. We pray that God would revive us again 
and not pass us by. Let's praise God then. The Psalm is 85. Well, it's great to see you tonight. You're very welcome. And if we haven't uh, met before, we're especially glad uh, that you've come to join with us uh, in our evening service. My name is Gareth Burke. I'm one of the ministers here in Stramelis, and uh, my colleague John Roger will be preaching this evening. And uh, we'd love to meet with you afterwards. There's a cup of tea and coffee and other refreshments available on the first floor. Um, so please do remain um, for that. Uh, if you just uh, slip out this door, turn right, and up the stairs, you'll, you'll hit the first uh, floor, and we'll be glad uh, to see you there. Uh, we're glad to see Andrew, uh, Andrew Moody, uh, here uh, this evening. Uh, Andrew is returning to Uganda on Friday. And uh, we pray for you, Andrew, as you go and pray that you'll know the Lord's blessing. And uh, do remember us warmly to Eunice. You will be glad uh, to see her again as you return to the work there. So do take a moment to have a word with Andrew uh, afterwards over uh, a cup of tea. That would be a lovely matter. 
Now, the announcements went out on the bulletin. I'm just going to highlight one or two things uh, very quickly, if, uh, if I may, uh, please. Um, the activities of the incoming week, please note that the Deacons Board is meeting on Thursday evening, that is Thursday evening, uh, at uh, a quarter to eight. Uh, the other activities of the church continue much as normal, except the ladies' Bible study is on on Wednesday morning at a quarter to ten, and the full details are there uh, in the uh, bulletin. Uh, the young adults are meeting next Sunday after the morning service for lunch in the home of Alan and Carol Baird. So if you're in the 20s to 30s age category, uh, please note that. That's next Sunday after uh, the morning service. Then the Evangelical Bookshop are holding a special lecture, not this Thursday, but a week on Thursday here in Stramillis. There are leaflets with the full details available in the foyer. William McKenzie of Christian Focus Publications is giving a talk on the spiritual benefits of reading Christian literature. Now, I've heard this talk some years ago and it's really well worth hearing, very valuable uh, talk from a winsome speaker on an important subject. So there's a good combination uh, that's a week on Thursday. Do plan to come at uh, 8 o'clock, uh, please. And then uh, we've been thinking uh, this morning, and we want to think again just now, uh, about the um, Foundations course. Some time ago, a Foundations course was held on Monday evening. And uh, something similar is going to be happening on these two dates in May, Monday the 13th and Monday the 20th of May. Now, if you weren't at the previous Foundations course, that's absolutely 100% fine. You don't need to have been at the other course to come to this. This is a standalone course for two Monday evenings. So you may be thinking, oh, I'd love to go to that, but I missed the last one. That doesn't matter. There's absolutely no problem. Uh, there are certain changes in this course from the last one. Uh, there's no pre-reading and no homework. So uh, that, that'll maybe clinch it for, for some. I think, right, we'll give this one a go. And uh, there is only one textbook, and that is the Bible. So you'll see there the details, uh, focusing on John 3.16 and looking at these two great questions. Why did Jesus have to die? And for whom did Jesus die? Now, it's uh, good if you can register and uh, David Gordon is the course facilitator, so please see David afterwards, even this evening. Uh, don't linger. Do it tonight. See David. Uh, hook up right away and uh, plan to come uh, on the course. Uh, but I thought it'd be useful uh, if we, you know, spoke to somebody who has been at the Foundations course previously, just to find out what it's really like. An insider's guide to Foundations. That's... Uh, could it, now, who was at the course before? Who could I ask who, who went before? Oh, Anna, would you like to, <laughs> would you like to come? Yes. It wasn't, that was, like, it wasn't a spontaneous society. It was just in case you it. Thank you very much, Thank Anna. You. That's great. Uh, so uh, we're just going to ask Anna a few uh, questions. And uh, we're very grateful to you for your willingness to do this um, tonight, uh, Anna. So you uh, attended the recent Foundations course. Okay, and that went for six weeks, yes. Monday evening for six weeks. But what was that all about? Okay, so thank you, Gareth. So the recent Foundations course was basically just a really great opportunity for several of us in the church to gather together to study the Westminster Confession of Faith in greater detail. Um, so as you said, it ran over six weeks. Um, we had homework to do and given a bit of background mm -hmm. reading. So each week we took a couple of chapters and looked at those in greater detail. There was a short lecture or talk on the more challenging aspects of the chapters and then a time for more informal discussion and opportunities to ask questions and just raise points that you felt were interesting from the material. Great. Great, that's a lovely, a lovely summary, Anna. Thank you, thank you for that. Now, you'll pardon me saying, Anna, but you're busy. Obviously, you know you have uh, you work, you have your your family and your husband, and uh, so you know <laughs> you've you have a lot to, to to do there. Like, why would you take out six Monday nights, you know, for a couple of hours or more, you know, to to do a foundations course? What motivated you to get involved in the course? 
Okay, so I think whenever the course was first advertised, I had just very recently become a member of the church. Mm -hmm. And obviously the church subscribes to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So I just personally felt it was important for me to try and gain as much knowledge and understanding of that as I could. Mm -hmm. um, I also didn't come from a Christian background, so I've always felt like my knowledge of doctrine, I needed to learn a bit more and develop that. So the course just really provided a great opportunity to do that. And not only did we have the opportunity to study it, but we got really great teaching. Um, David Gordon put so much effort into everything. Yeah, it was quite and, good, was it? Yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> um, and we were so thankful for that. Um, but we also had the opportunity to ask lots of questions in a really relaxed environment as well. Yes. And looking back, like, was there a standout moment at all? Was there anything that you really, you know, as you went up the road in the car, thought, whoa, that was good? <laughs> um, so I think just overall, I really enjoyed the course. And my ultimate goal, obviously, was to try and deepen my knowledge of doctrine, mm. which mm -hmm. I feel the course definitely right. um, achieved. I think I found it challenging. There's definitely certain aspects of it that were really difficult. And I had a few questions about parts of the confession, um, which at the start were a wee bit unnerving. But I mm. think through the teaching and everything that we studied, we were really encouraged to have those questions and to use those to try and grow and develop, um, to seek God's word for those answers. And also just through our learning that the Bible is complete and sufficient and that God has given us all of the answers that we need so it's okay to find the topics challenging and difficult and not mm. necessarily have or know the answers to it all good good thanks anna you don't mind one final question uh, <laughs> the, the uh, course that we've got up here in the graphic uh, okay it's only two nights and it's a wee bit different to the last one uh, because uh, we love the westminster confession and it was good to get into that but this time we're just focusing really on the word on the bible itself uh, in these two two nights so it's a bit different to the last one it's shorter uh, it's got a slightly different emphasis there are you going to sign up uh, yes i am looking forward to the courses in may um, and i would just really encourage anybody who is considering signing up to do so um, it was i really enjoyed it and felt it was really worthwhile it was also a really nice opportunity to spend time with other people in the congregation just to have a bit of fellowship and I think people in the course would agree we learned a lot from each other everybody has yes. different experiences and perspectives and people got really great ideas that you maybe wouldn't have considered before so we had some really interesting conversations and great. yeah it was really enjoyable oh that's great thank you so much Anna very kind of you to contribute thank in that you. way we're, we're very grateful that was good Good. Well, let's pray together just now, shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you and bless you for your goodness to us as a people. Uh, we look within for a moment and think of our own congregation. Uh, we thank you for what Anna has just shared with us concerning the Foundations course, and we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to go deeper into the things of your word. We pray for that, O oh God that we may not be those who just sort of skirt along the top of scripture, but that we may be those who dig down deep. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that this uh, course in May uh, may be uh, well subscribed to, and that it might prove to be very useful for us as a congregation, uh, that we may learn from the teaching, that we may stimulate one another through conversation and discussion, bless David as he facilitates, and as he teaches, we commit it to you, O oh God. We pray too for our brother Andrew, who's with us this evening. We ask that you would remember him as he prepares to return to Uganda on Friday. We pray that you would overrule in flights and logistics. Uh, we ask that you would be with Eunice and with Andrew and Eunice together as they are reunited after several months being apart. We pray for your blessing upon uh, the ministry in Goli and in Yumbi. And we pray in these coming months there may be encouragement in that work we look out O oh god from ourselves to the world in which you have placed us 
We come this evening as those who are somewhat concerned about the developing situation in the Middle East and asking you, O God, our Father, that you would overrule. We pray that the situation may not develop and escalate and we ask that you would give wisdom to those involved. And now for ourselves, we pray. You know us, O oh God. You know what our need is tonight. You know where we're hurting and where we're struggling. Please, O oh Lord, as you so often do, as the word is open to us here, touch us and speak to us, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's continue to praise our God as we sing Holy Spirit living breath of God. Please turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We're starting, as Gareth mentioned, a new series uh, over the next couple of months, I guess. We're going to be thinking through the life of Gideon. Uh, and tonight, really, we want to introduce that series. Uh, we're focusing 
on verses 1 to 10 here. We will read verses 1 to 18. Uh, we'll go a little bit further than that, but Gareth, I think we'll come back next week and start at verse 11 and speak to us more about Gideon and the call of Gideon. Tonight, we're setting the scene. We're thinking about the context as we read Judges 6 and verses 1 to 18. Let us hear the word uh, of the living God. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or donkey or ox. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come up like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Ab Abbey's right, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you. O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. Amen. Let's leave the reading there and we thank God for his word. Let's pray. Father, please speak to us now through your word. May your spirit come upon us and help us both hearer and preacher alike so that all we do will be to your honor, praise and glory. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now the book of Judges is the story of the unfaithfulness of God's people of Israel. The book of Judges is the story of an unfaithful people. God had brought them out of Egypt. He defeated their enemies. He'd settled them in the, the promised land. He'd given them this beautiful place of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. And God called his people in light of all of that to walk with him, to worship him, to live with him. But they didn't. The story of the book is summed up in its final verse, chapter 21 and verse 25. There, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's a story of anarchy. It's a story of chaos. 
It's a story where God's people want to be the king, where they're pushing God off his throne, where they won't listen to God and repeatedly they're unfaithful to him. And we see that story cycling in the book of Judges because there is this cycle that happens where the land of Canaan and God's people in the land are at rest. And then the people rebel against God. And so God lets them come to ruin, usually through the hand of an oppressive nation who, are, who invade them. And so then the people repent, return to God. God rescues them with a judge. And the land is at rest again, but the cycle repeats. The story of Judges is the story of an unfaithful people. But that's not all that the book of Judges is, because the story of Judges is the story of a faithful God. A God who restores his people. A God who forgives his people. A God who time and time again takes his people back, comes to seek them and find them and confront them about their sin. And a God who delights to rescue his people and pour upon them his grace. This it's the story of judges. It's a story of unfaithfulness, but it's the story of the God who restores. And so tonight, what I want us to do as we introduce the person of Gideon is to focus more on the God of judges than we focus on Gideon in this story. We want to focus more on God than on Gideon. Because it's good news for us, isn't it? That God is a God who restores. So often we are like Israel. We are unfaithful to the Lord but we have a Lord who restores our souls, one who forgives us, one who brings us back, one who speaks words of truth and yet words of grace. So let's think about these verses tonight, and we're going to do that under three headings. Uh, we want firstly to see that God is seeking his people, verses 1 to 6, and we're going to see that even through the oppression of Midian, God is seeking his people. He's calling to them to come back to him. Then we're going to see that God is speaking to his people. God's people cry out for help. And how does God help them? He sends a prophet to speak his word, to confront them very clearly about their sin because they need to understand how they have sinned against God. He's speaking to his people. And thirdly, we're going to see that God is strengthening his man because God is going to deliver. He's going to deliver through a man, a weak man, and as Gideon's introduced to us, the writer of Judges is underlining his weakness to us. But God is going to strengthen him. So he's seeking, he's speaking, and he's strengthening. Firstly, will you see with me that God is speaking to his people, verses 1 to 6. He's speaking to his people. We find Israel in these verses in a very sad state. As we meet them here at the start of Judges 6, the picture we have is one of weakness. It's a sad, sad picture. They're a helpless people. Look at what is happening to them. God had given his people, you remember, that the land of Canaan, it was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was more than sufficient to meet all of their needs. But as we meet them, for seven long years, the people of Israel, every time the harvest comes round, have had to flee from their farms. They've ran to the north where there's mountainous area and they're in the caves in those mountains in hiding. You see, here's what's happening. Not far from Israel, there's a nomadic group of people, boys and girls, that means people who travel around and don't have their own home and live in tents or caravans. And that's what the Midianites were. They were a nomadic people who traveled around. And every harvest time, the people of Midian were entering Israel. All year long, they let the Israelites work the land, plant their crops, tend them, water them, get them ready for harvest. And then every year for seven years, just at the right moment, the people of Midian invaded. They swept everything in the land before them. They took the Israelites' crops and wheat. They took their oxen and sheep and cows and animals. Everything was taken from them. And the people of Israel had to flee. 
Just think about how disheartening that must have felt for God's people. All year long they worked. And then for seven years, every time harvest came, they had to run from their work. And the writer gives us a vivid picture of just how powerless Israel are to defend themselves against Midian. Look at Midian's size, for example. Verse 5, we read that they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. They are huge. And what's more, they've entered into an alliance with the Amalekites and other peoples from the east. Israel don't stand a chance. Look at the scale of their invasion in verse 4. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is they entered Israel from the east. They moved west through the plain of Jezreel, which was the very fertile land where most of the crops were grown, and they moved as far west as Gaza. They swept from east to west, and they took everything. Just imagine life for Israel. Poor, tired, hungry, weak. And they're crying out to God, their God, the God of Israel, to rescue and help and save them. But God's not rescuing. At least not yet. In fact, there's a staggering truth at the heart of verse 1. Do you see it there? The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian. Why has all this happened? Why are they having to run every year for seven years? Because God has given them into the hand of their enemies. See, God's people were embroiled in sin. They were worshiping the gods of the indigenous Canaanites, gods that were forbidden to them, idols of wood and stone and metal. And it wasn't just a little problem, it was widespread throughout the nation. We're, we're going to see in the coming weeks that it was a problem in Gideon's family. His family were worshiping the Baal gods. And these people who were supposed to be holy, set apart to worship God, who were supposed to be attractive, a light to the nations around them, these people were just like everyone else. And so God seeks them. God seeks his people. You see, he cares enough about their souls to starve their stomachs for this period. He cares about their souls. And so he seeks out his people. He's using even the wicked Midianites to call his people to repentance. Now, that was exactly what God had told his people he would do uh, if they fell into the sin uh, of worshiping the gods of the Canaanites. Back in Deuteronomy 28, they're about to enter the promised land. Uh, and God warns them. He says, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, then the Lord, verse 25, will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat any of it. Your donkey shall be seized before your face, but shall not be restored to you. A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and of all your labors, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. It's exactly what was happening to Israel. Exactly as God had promised, God is seeking his people. Friends, God seeks his people. God always seeks his people, and in his perfect wisdom, Sometimes God brings difficulties into our lives to show us our sin. You see, he's always seeking sinners. He's always seeking to bring us to repentance. Now you say to me, hold on a minute. God brings difficulties into our lives to show us our sin. Isn't that harsh? That sounds mean. 
That's not very fair. In fact, I don't want to follow a God like that. Just imagine for a minute that uh, you go down to the, the Cherry Valley playing fields, down the Omer Road, uh, down to the playground, the play park there with the kids or the grandkids. It's a good play park because there's a coffee truck that sits there. And uh, if it's a sunny day, there's an ice cream truck that's there as well. So it's a good play park to go to. And you're there, and there's a child just running around the playground, doing anything that they want, pushing over other children, pushing them off the swing because they want to have a turn on the swings. They're pulling the hair of children who are running past them. In fact, they're endangering themselves because they're running over the top of the monkey bars, and they climb to the big climbing frame and just jump off the top. And you see, you're looking around for the parents. Where on earth are the parents? And you see them, and they're laughing. And they're clapping their chats. Oh, you're having a great time. Keep on going and having fun there and proud of you. What would you think? You think, well, that parent doesn't love that child very much. You see, God is the heavenly father who loves his children enough to show us our sin, to seek us out. The writer to the Hebrews talks about this in uh, Hebrews 12. In verse 4, he says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he reproves. God loves his children. And so God seeks out his children to show them their sin. This is the kindness. This is the grace of God that we're seeing for Israel tonight. Perhaps that's you tonight. Your heavenly father has seen some hidden sin in your life. Some habitual sin in your life. And through the circumstances of life, he is seeking you because he wants you to repent. Or perhaps tonight you've never come to repentance. God is seeking you tonight because the Bible tells us he wills that none should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. God is seeking sinners. He's seeking his people. Now we need to be balanced with that truth. We need to be careful with that truth. I was at a playground over Easter uh, with my wider family and uh, we, children and adults, thought that we'd get on a seesaw at one point. And we were trying to balance the seesaw with children and adults on the seesaw, which was quite a feat. And it's quite hard sometimes to balance this truth. What we tend to do is we go to one extreme or the other. Either we think that every time something goes wrong in our lives, that well, God must be speaking to me about a particular sin, but that's not what the Bible says. That's why the story of Job is in the Bible. That's why Peter and James introduced their epistles to us by speaking to us about trials that come into our lives to mature our faith. No, no, we mustn't think that. But we can also go to the other extreme and we can think that God is never speaking to us through our difficulties about our sin. And that's what Israel were doing. And that's why, secondly, we see that God is speaking to his people. Verses 7 to 10, God is speaking to his people. You see, what is God's answer to his people? How does he respond to them as they cry to him for help? Surely he'll deliver them. Surely he'll raise up a judge to redeem them and rescue them. But look what he does. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And listen to what he says. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt, brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. God speaks to his people. 
God speaks to his people and he makes the situation crystal clear. God wants his people to understand why all this disaster has happened. God needs his people to understand why they are in the situation that they are in. It's because of the way they're living their lives. And so he comes and he puts his finger on their sin. He knows that what they need more than a man of war is a man of the word. What they need more than a prince to deliver them is a prophet who will preach to them. What they need more even than the hand of God to save them is the finger of God on the sin in their lives because God cares, he cares about their souls. God cares about his people's spiritual lives and walks and he cares enough to speak to us about our sin. See, friends, it reminds us, doesn't it, that the word of God has a convicting aspect, that part of the function of God's word in the life of a believer is to hold up our lives against the standard of God's law and act like a mirror and show us where we fall short. Growing up, um, my mom and dad had a friend who was a missionary in Zambia. And every so often she would return home on furlough and she would come to visit us. Uh, And it was always good fun to see uh, Helen, Auntie Helen as we called her. Uh, And whenever Helen was around your dinner table, Uh, you knew she was there because living in Zambia, she didn't have a lot of food. And so she was malnourished. And so she was eating up everything, everything. So if you had chicken for dinner, she would finish the, the drumstick or whatever she was eating. And then you would see her gnawing away at the bone. And boys and girls, inside a chicken bone or any bone, there's something called marrow. But to get the marrow, which is full of nutrients, you've got to break the bone. And so she'd be gnawing it just gently, sucking away at it, gnawing it, and then eventually she'd get the marrow because she didn't have a lot of food in Zambia. So this was precious to her. She had to break the bone to get it. Do you remember what the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 4? about the word of God. Verse 12, he says, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged source, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying that sometimes as God speaks to us in his word, what the word does is it gets into the parts of our lives that we can't see ourselves. It pierces our hearts. It breaks us open between joint and marrow so that we can see what's really inside our hearts because the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. We don't even know our own thoughts and intentions, but as God's word speaks to us, it's convicting us of our sin. It's showing us what we're really like inside. Sometimes that's what the word has to do to us, isn't it? It breaks us open breaks our hearts, shows us our sin, shows us our anger, our pride, our greed, our lust, whatever it is, it opens us up and shows it to us. And that is God's kindness to us. That is God's grace and mercy to us to show us what we're like and call us, call us back to himself. You see, God loves us enough to seek us out. And God's grace is big enough to speak to us in his word. And then thirdly, I want you to see God is strengthening. He's strengthening his man. He's strengthening his man. He's sought out his people, spoken to his people, and now he strengthens his man Let's just think about Gideon for a moment or two because that's who our study is about. And as the writer of Judges introduces Gideon to us, what we see most of all in him, or what I want you to notice most of all in him tonight, is that he is a weak man. 
God is going to use him to deliver Israel, but he is a weak man. Look at who he is, first of all. You see that in verse 15. As God commissions him to deliver his people, he responds like this, Please, Lord, how can I see of Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. There were 12 tribes in Israel, and one of the tribes was comprised of two halves, of Ephraim and Manasseh. And Gideon is from Manasseh. He's from a half tribe, the smallest tribe. And he's from the family who are the least within that tribe. And he himself holds the least position, presumably he's the youngest son in that family. He is a weak man. Look at where he is. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abbey's right, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Where is he? He's hiding in the wine press. The wine press was an underground cellar where the grapes were stored, uh, where the wine had been pressed out and, and when it was stored after the grapes had been trodden. And Gideon's down there underground, beating out the weight so that the Midianites can't find him. He's hiding from the enemy. He's not standing up with a sword ready to take them on. He's in hiding. And look at what he's thinking. You see it in verse 13? Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonderful deeds that our father recounted to us? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Do you see how mixed up his theology is? He thinks, well, if God was really with us, none of this would have happened. If God was really on our side, then he wouldn't have let this happen to us. He doesn't seem to know Deuteronomy chapter 28. He doesn't seem to have read the providence of God. He hasn't got the message. Because he's weak. He's weak. God is going to use him. Now, why does God use weak people? Why doesn't God save Israel himself with his own hand? Why does he use a weak man like Gideon? Because God wants the glory. Because God wants the glory. Time and again in this study, we are going to see that. God wants the glory. He'll send Gideon into battle with a big army and he'll reduce it down because it's too big, lest he doesn't get the glory. God wants the glory. I don't know if you've ever been to a, a classical music concert, but if you have, you'll, you'll have seen that the orchestra on stage and the last thing that happens before the orchestra starts playing, usually at a classical concert, is that the conductor walks on to applause. And then after the piece is finished, the first thing that happens is the conductor leaves the stage to applause. And if the applause goes on for long enough, then the conductor comes back out to take an encore and play something else and goes off again and the cycle goes on. Now, why does the conductor get the applause? I mean, he or she isn't playing a violin or a trumpet or a flute. They're not down there on the floor that the orchestra are on. Why does the conductor get the applause? Because it's a recognition from the crowd, isn't it? That it's the conductor who is central. He or she has trained the musicians. He or she has interpreted the music, the dynamics, the speed. He or she is overseeing the score to bring each instrument in at the right part it's their masterpiece. And so they get the applause. Why does God use weak Gideon? Why doesn't he go out in the battlefield himself and save Israel? Because God is conducting his people so that he will get the glory. And he's going to strengthen Gideon. Notice how Notice how he will strengthen him. He comes to him in verse 12, and he says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, Gideon is not right now a mighty man of valor, but by God's grace and strength, that is what he will become. But how does God strengthen him? He says twice, The Lord is with you. Once in verse 12, 
And once in verse 16, the Lord is with you. It's good news for us tonight, isn't it? God often calls us in the Christian life to things which, humanly speaking, feel way, way beyond us, to things which put us way out of our comfort zones. But the Lord is with us. He will strengthen us. That's the key thing. Perhaps here tonight you feel weak in your life. You feel like Gideon. You feel weak because of the circumstances of life. Things are happening in your life which you're finding difficult physically to your health or emotionally with uncertainty about the future and you feel really weak what's the comfort for you it's that God can strengthen you simply by his presence we started off our service this morning uh, and Mervyn read to us from Psalm 46 a great psalm where we're told that God is the refuge and strength of his people do you remember the little phrase that runs through that psalm? Why is it that the psalmist can express such confidence in God? Because the Lord of hosts is with us. Because the Lord of hosts is with us. God would be with Gideon. God is with you. But notice who it was that was with Gideon. Did you notice it as we read verses 11 to 16? Who was it who was strengthening Gideon? It was Jesus, it was Jesus himself. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came. When we read in verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you. Now Gideon doesn't get it. Please my Lord or please sir, he's saying, verse 13. But then verse, the end of verse 13, the writer spells it out, but now uh, we're sorry, verse 14, the Lord turned to him. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is always the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus himself has come to strengthen his weak servant to lead his people to safety, to deliver and rescue his people of Israel. Friends, that's the faithfulness of God. See, God loves his people so very much that he sent his son into this world to seek lost sinners. God loves his people so much that he sent his son to speak a word of peace and love and grace on the cross, which was his pulpit, where he proclaimed God's love to a sinful world. And God loves his people so much that he sends his son to strengthen his weak people, to bring them all the way home, to be with him in heaven. Have you come to his son tonight? Is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me close with the words of a hymn I wish I would have picked this hymn to close with, but I didn't. It's the, it's the hymn by Horatius Bonner. And it says, I hear the words of love. I gaze upon the blood. I see the mighty sacrifice. And I have peace with God. It's everlasting peace. Sure as Jehovah's name. It's stable as his steadfast throne forevermore the same. The clouds may go and come and storms may sweep my sky, but this blood-sealed friendship changes not. The cross is ever nigh. My love is oft times low, just like Israel's. My joy still ebbs and flows, but peace with him remains the same. No change Jehovah knows. I change, he changes not. The Christ can never die. His love, not mine, the resting place, his truth, not mine, the time. Amen, and may God bless his word to our souls. Well, now we're going to sing together. It's a, a lovely hymn of Charles Wesley. O oh, Jesus, full of truth and grace, more full of grace than I have sinned. Yet once again I seek your face. Open your arms 
and take me in and freely my backslidings heal and love the faithless sinner still. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.